The purpose of this podcast is simple. We want you to get to know your doctor before meeting them in person because you're making a life-changing decision and time is scarce. The more you can learn about who your doctor is before you meet them, the better that first meeting will be. There is no substitute for an in-person appointment, but we hope this comes close. I'm your host, Eva Shea, and you're listening to Meet the Doctor. Welcome back to Meet the Doctor. My guest today is Dilip Madnani. He's a facial plastic surgeon practicing in New York City and on Long Island. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. It's so nice to have you here, and I'm so glad that you took the time on a Saturday to come see us. But you were working today, weren't you? Yes, we yeah. work uh, about two Saturdays a month, so we planned it accordingly. I'm sure that's a nice option for patients who can't make it during the week. That for you sure. Do that. Yeah. yeah, we do like two late days a week, one on Long Island, one here in the city, and then uh, Saturdays here. Do you prefer one office over the other? No, it's different. You know, it's like I get the, uh, it's a nice change of scenery being out on Long Island. How do you get yourself back and forth? I just drive. We start early, so surgery usually, usually starts at 6 or 6.30, so there's no traffic. We leave here, I leave here around 5.30. What do you like to do while you're driving? Audiobooks and podcasts. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, do you have a favorite podcast that you listen to? Favorite one? No, I was. Uh, we, we were talking about it before. I do a lot of, I guess, philosophy, entrepreneurship, anything that can just open my mind. And then once in a while, I'll do about inter- interesting things. But we talked about entrepreneurship podcasts or Tim Ferriss, Tony Robbins, that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Just keep my mind open. What about books? Books, audiobooks is also very similar. You know, I like to do, I've been doing a few autobiographies. And then now I'm doing one on reading a book on stoicism. <laughs> yeah, they're both good categories. There's yeah. a, lot, a lot to learn there, almost infinite, I'm sure. Correct. And then, you know, as a doctor here or a plastic surgeon here, you're also running a small business. So those audiobooks and podcasts really help with that. You're not just running a small business. You're in the most competitive, probably hardest market on earth Correct. to run a small business. Correct. So you can't really afford to make a lot of mistakes or maybe just big mistakes. We learn quickly. Yes. And then our business is a lot of psychology too. So I joke, we are therapists with a scalpel. <laughs> so having to market the business, deliver on what we have to, and then manage patients' emotional transformations during surgery is, I think, very important. So I think the first six years of my career was heavily focused on learning that part while getting really good at what I do. Tell me more about the emotional part. It's the most important, I think, because a lot of times we as surgeons uh, focus on outcomes, but aesthetic outcomes, right? So. You know, I've, uh, we have, we were, we were talking earlier about, you know, the awake facelifts that I do and or in local anesthesia or whatever, yeah, blah, blah, blah. But we have a lot of doctors come in. So, I mean, I've been invited to go speak in Brazil in August. I have uh, doctors from Spain, from here, from everywhere. They come in to learn these techniques. And it's so, it's amazing how they're so bogged down in the technicality of the, of the surgery. You know, facelift surgery has evolved from just skin to just tightening a little bit of muscle to elevating the, all the tissue over the bone, and now it's in the kind of uh, a middle ground. But I started on my career, you know, 15 years ago doing facelifts, and I've had happy patients 15 years ago, and I've built my practice on happy patients, and now, you know, the quote-unquote deep plane technique or whatever the extended techniques are, I, I do that, but I would say my patients are just as happy. Me, as a surgeon, I am happier with my aesthetic outcomes but I'm sure if you took a survey of our patients from my patients from 15 years ago to now, I mean, I have more patients now, but I'm going to bet you the satisfaction rate's probably about the same. And I think it's more to do how you treat them and how you, and how they handle that transformational journey. Obviously we don't want complications. Those are all things that we discuss with patients, but it's a statistics game at that point. So you mentioned that you focus on facelifts. How did you decide that that's what you were going to go all in on? It was a combination of things where I didn't want to have to, I wanted to control the environment from start to finish. So I didn't want to have to go to a hospital. I didn't want to have to have uh, an anesthesiologist present at every case. I didn't want to have to have uh, the risks of general anesthesia. And I wanted to be able to reliably predict my surgical outcomes and 
in my hands, face of surgery was ideal for that. So for example, I don't even do rhinoplasties. Like we'll do blepharoplasties, we'll do facelifts, neck lifts. And I love injectables too. Injectables is a whole other art form that I'm, you know, I love to do. So my practice is heavily focused a bit on injectables and non-surgical, but, and facelifts. Mm -hmm. So early on, I figured out facelifts was a way to go. And I went all in on that. It's been a um, popular topic today in terms of the facelift and not just um, lifting and tightening, but also restoring volume. Correct. And there's quite a few ways you can do that. Can mm -hmm. you talk to that a little bit? I actually did a little talk about that Thursday, about the volume, how the nuances are of the technique vary by surgeon. So even though we're all doing the same surgery, I mean, so you have three different artists all using charcoal, for example they're all going to, their artwork is going to look a little different, even though they're drawing the same thing, right? So we're all using the same techniques, we're all using the same media, but I think we, whether you add a little volume, whether you do a little resurfacing, whether you pull a little bit more on the upper part of the face versus the lower part of the face, whether you volumize the jawline versus just the mid face, those are all things that come, I think, with experience, but also with talking to the patient and seeing what they want done. So for example, yesterday I had, I had three facelift consults and one of them had a really bad experience from a fat transfer many, many, many years ago, right? And, but she's unhappy with her aging face. So my aim is to not focus on volumizing for her, but just to kind of restore her aging face and have her come back maybe later when she's, once I've developed trust with her, we can talk about volumizing at that time. So she didn't want to have more volume put in because she had a bad experience years ago. She wanted everything but I wanted to ease her into it. I don't think she was mentally prepared because she's so focused on a bad experience she had before with the volume enhancement, right? So I think either way, even with our techniques, we're able to add some volume with the mid face lifting during the facelift. So for her, it wasn't a deal breaker for me. There's some patients that are so significantly volume depleted that you're like, I have to do something with your volume. And there are other patients that are on the fence and that's kind of where you have to kind of gauge it. Does that kind of judgment only come with many years of seeing faces day in and day out. I think out. for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I think for sure. And I think you can see that also. And uh, we encourage patients or patients ask about what are things to look for in your surgeon or how do you find a surgeon or how do you find someone if you don't have a referral source or, or a direct referral where you've seen the actual outcomes. I mean, you have to, you know, sites like Real Self are great, podcasts are great. You know, you have to do your research online. Google is great. But once you once you found a few surgeons, you have to look at their before and afters because you will see a difference between different surgeons. You know, it doesn't matter. We're all doing the same surgery, but look at the uh, before and afters and then meet, meet the doctor and see what kind of rapport you have with them. But that's kind of how you assess the overall results of what you can potentially get. If something not necessarily is wrong, but if they have a concern after they've had surgery. Yeah, once you touch a patient, they basically belong to you. And that's kind of how it works at our practice. And I'm sure a lot of mon a lot of surgeons too. You know, you, you own, but you want to make the patient happy once again, right? And there's two kinds of happiness. One is the patient doesn't feel they're, they got the result they should have. And that's more of an expectation versus a bad outcome or result, or they have suffered a complication. Right. So that's, I like to break, separate that. Definitely. So our consultation process is, is quite streamlined at this point. By the time you're coming to see me, you've spoken to about five people in my office. You know, you've seen my videos online. You've actually seen me do surgery. Not only do we post before and after pictures, but we have before and after videos where you, you can't edit those videos. You can't Photoshop those videos. And we show videos of patients a day after, a week after, a month after. So you can actually see the healing as well. Right, so we try not to hide anything. So you're pretty well prepared by the time you come and see me. Yesterday I had a patient that we turned away because even though it's her second time in my office, she was asking me questions as if she had no idea what a facelift involved. She was unclear as to the incision placement. She was unclear about muscle tightening. She was unclear about bruising. And usually for me, those are all red flags because by the time they come and see me, they've spoken to at least three different people to explain all of that. And they've received literature about that too. And then she had an event coming up, so she wanted to speed things through before the event. So those are all red flags where I felt she wasn't well prepared. So we suggested she go home, do her homework, and call us back next week, right? So those are all, that way everyone has time to cool off and think, and that way the patient's done their due diligence properly. So that goes back to expectations. I have little kids, and I like to say to my older daughter, I didn't say no, I said not now. There's a difference. Right. And that's what you just did. You told her 
Not right. now. Not now. And even though she had been back, for, she was, she came in a year ago also, yeah. and she wasn't ready then. She doesn't seem like she's fully prepared now. And she's an educated professional who I feel is just not taking this as serious as I feel she should. And she spoke to another patient. There's a patient of mine who was in that, who's six months post-op. She's, she looks beautiful. She's very happy. She's actually a medical professional, a therapist. So she was kind enough to speak to that other patient. And even her, when after the patient, even her point of view, we were speaking after, she's like, she's not ready. I'm like, yes, she's not ready. But we become therapists. Mm -hmm. As I was going back to our, our earlier conversation, sure. therapists with a scalpel. Faces are very different from any mm. other part of the body. We have to look at our face in the mirror every day. Can't hide it with a t-shirt or pants. You could hide it with a mask for a little while. That's, why, not any, not that's really why we all got more. busy. That's why we all got busy over COVID. Because everyone was like, I can hide. Oh, heal. I can hide. I yeah. can hide the recovery, right? Yeah. I can still work and I can hide the recovery. One of the other silver linings of that whole thing was, was for facial plastic surgeons. Yeah. So another really unique thing about your practice is that you're doing everything under local. So you don't have to go to a hospital. You don't have to go to a surgery center. I guess, is that a thing here in New York? We, in Texas, they're everywhere. Yes, there, it is a thing here, but we're, we still certify. We have to have a quad A certification for the operating rooms. You know, we have certified personnel in the operating rooms. We offer IV sedation, which is twilight or propofol, or we do local anesthesia with oral sedation. This is what you have in your office. Correct. Yes. You know, and we have... Uh, I would say 80% of my patients opt for the local anesthesia with oral sedation and 20% opt for the IV sedation. So it really varies. I tell my patients, you decide it doesn't change your outcomes, doesn't change the surgery times. I have some patients that are afraid to be awake. I have some patients that are afraid to be asleep. So for me, it doesn't matter. I want you to be comfortable. That's a great answer. And I, that's the question I was forming in my head was, what is, what is the actual difference? And you broke it down very nicely. What are the benefits really other than, um, you know, certainly it's more convenient to not have to go to another facility. Perfect. Right. The convenience is great. There's a little, a little bit of additional costs with the anesthesiologist being present. Mm -hmm. And in some patients that just had bad experiences with anesthesia in the past. So, I mean, I know I had my colonoscopy. I didn't have the best experience after that. I don't want to go into too much detail, but... You know, but that was, uh, I think it was an anesthesia related issue and that was fine, but that was just me. Obviously, I don't want a colonoscopy awake, but there are some patients that just don't have great experiences with that. And, you know, we've been doing this for, for almost 15 years now. So we have a, we're very comfortable with the local anesthesia part of it. I think that's where I was going to go next is when you have a consistent, stable environment for surgery like you do mm -hmm. in your office. Mm -hmm. I assume you have mostly or almost always the same people too. Exactly. And that's key. First of all, my front desk and my management team have been with me for years. The nursing team, our physician assistants, the OR team, the surgical technicians, I'm looking to expand to other locations. And the only way I would do that is I can still control my environment, right? So I would bring my nurse with me because I don't need my surgical tech with me, but I need one other medical professional with me to oversee my surroundings so I can focus on what I'm doing. I'll even bring my one management person with me or front desk person with me because I want the experience to be the same and I want to make sure I control all those factors, right? So it's so easy to go and do something somewhere else. However, you want to replicate the experience rather than the surgery. Surgery is easy. It's all the peripheral stuff around the surgery mm -hmm. that you want to replicate. We produce podcasts this way too, and certainly they're much lower stakes than surgery, but we try to control every single thing that we can control so that when something does, if something does go wrong, you're prepared. then we're ready for it, right? Yeah. And that's what it is. You're preparing for the worst, and but 99% of the time, everything's perfect. Mm -hmm. Who are these people on your team and how long have, have they been with you? We have about close to 30 people on our team, and we have... Um, I have a few mid-level providers because we, we have a large injectable practice too. I love injectables. For me, it's just another, it's another paintbrush uh, to mold the face. Actually, to be honest, I've learned a lot of new principles, surgical principles based off of the injectables that I do. And it's really nice to, to transfer that back and forth. So I have uh, two PAs and a nurse that also do injectables in my practice. And for them, they learn a lot because they get to walk into the OR every day with me. And hey, can you show me that anatomy again? You know, who gets to see where you actually place the Botox? Who gets to see where you actually put that filler? 
So that's their value add is they're anatomically much more educated than than most of the providers out there, which is amazing for them. Mm -hmm. And for me, I also learned from them because, you know, the direction of needle placement, the amount of product, the different products, it's amazing what I learned from them because they do it on a volume basis that I get to learn from them too. So that way we play off each other. But for me, it just translates directly into surgical outcomes too. It sounds like you have a really good team that complements each other. Yes. Yeah. And just focusing on the face allows us to just be, you know, that's our purpose, I would say. It's always important to have a purpose and kind of, I came to that this year. The purpose is not expanding or taking over the world. The purpose is uh, being the best in, in facial rejuvenation. And I think all the other stuff follows around that. So, but you had to lead with that one purpose. Mm -hmm. I haven't heard you mention skin yet. Do you do anything or is there anyone on your team who helps also with skin? We because it's such a, a critical... A lot of skin. A yeah. lot of skin work. And that's where the energy-based devices come in. We do a lot of laser skin resurfacing. So we, and we do, we do some, some chemical peels, but we go a lot deeper because we're a lot more comfortable. So I do 90% I do of my surgeries are having erbium or CO2 laser skin resurfacing done with it. During surgery? Yep. And we do a lot of microneedling, radiofrequency. We do a lot of PRPs. We do a lot of nanofat. I'm a big fan of all the skin rejuvenation products out there, whether it's exosomes that are, I know, uh, controversial, but new, uh, nanofat. I've been doing fat transfer for 15 years. I mean, it's all the rage now, but it's always been the rage. We, I do it not only for volumizing, but I do it for skin rejuvenation. I specifically tell my patients, we're going to do two things. We're going to volumize and we're going to rejuvenate. And that's where the fat transfer comes in, along with the CO2 lasers. And we're a big, we have a big fan of skincare. We have, so we, I put all my patients on some kind of retinoid in the evenings, but it's great that we can just provide this one stop start to finish. Like I have this gentleman who came in yesterday again, he would never have done a facelift, never. He's in his sixties, very good looking gentleman. He just aged tremendously. He's six months after he can't be happier. You can't tell he's at a facelift. He's got a uh, stubble, he's very distinguished. And now he's like, can we do that? And I didn't, I don't, I don't like to push anything, but he came back. He's like, can we, can we do some Botox again? Cause I did some just for him to try it out. I'm just like, aren't I do? It's been three months. And he's like, and the skincare, can you remind me again the order? Cause I put him on whatever I, I use. And then, but he's so like vested now into his maintenance. You got him. We got him, but <laughs> we're not also overselling or anything. He's just in a comfortable place. He's like, he feels comfortable. We're comfortable. He's on his way. I'll see you in three months. Well, I think it starts to have the effects, the positive effects of mm -hmm. doing these things start to build on themselves. You look better and then you feel better. Of course, totally. He's so then you start thinking, what else can I do? If that worked and made me feel this much better, what else is yeah. there? And that's where you also want to be the patient's guide, right? And that's a lot of responsibility. And that's where it's, once again, you want to look at before and afters. You want to make sure you're not overfilling, you're not overdoing, and that's where you have to have slowly ease patients in. And once again, the principle, you know, leader in facial rejuvenation, natural results go from there. Mm -hmm. If I went to your staff and I said, how would you describe Dr. Madani? What do you think they would say? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't like talking about myself that way, but um, I don't know. I'm, I'm sure they would just say dedicated. I'm sure they would just say honest, dedicated, and just... I push myself as hard as I push them. So we're all held to the same standard. You know, my manager was saying, we have a patient who's very happy with the result. She works in the community at, uh, on Long Island. She's, so we're gonna, she wants me to do TV ads because she works for a production company. And she's like, you know, I had such a wonderful time. People need to know about facelifts that you're doing. That I didn't, no, one, no one's aware about it. I found you through a referral. And then she was telling my manager how I called her the day before surgery. And I do that for all my patients. And my manager's like, I didn't think you were still doing that. How, how do you have the time? And my manager who, she's like, you know, I see her more than I see anyone. And, and I'm like, you think I'm only a pain in the butt to you about following <laughs> our protocols? I'm like, I keep myself to the same standard. I've been doing it for 15 years and I'm not going to stop. I mean, it's just a nice thing to do. The patient now has your number before surgery. It, it calms a lot of people down, especially with these local anesthesia facelifts. So she was, she was shocked. I'm like, I was shocked that she was shocked, but... I hold everyone out to the same, to the same standard. I think it's clear that that standard is what is turning into great results for your patients. And so it might not always be 
easy and it might be unpleasant sometimes, but the goal is always the same. Correct. But I don't think it's ever meant to be easy. Nothing that's worth doing is ever exactly. easy. Right. right. And I think that's what it is. I think I think that's where we, we think we tend to coast. But like I take courses, I teach, I give talks, I also give my staff, I I pay for their higher education. We send them to conferences because I think everybody just needs that. You know, we can't be complacent. That's a perfect segue into training. And training is very important. People often don't understand doctor training and doctor credentials, but if you can give us a little bit of a, an overview of your training and why it was important, I think that would be useful. I mean, in a nutshell, it's four years college. I did five years med school because I did a year of research and then it was five years of residency. But to be honest, you're, you know, you're only in your thirties when you graduate and you're just getting started. And I think it starts from there. I don't think it, uh, I think it's a fallacy to think that you're all done once you've, once you've received, once you've, whether you're fellowship or residency, it doesn't matter. You're the last 10 years, to be honest, have been more, obviously more pertinent training because I'm, you know, hyper-focused in one area and I get to devote all my time and energy, but all the other work that we did 15 years before laid the groundwork mm -hmm. to what we do now. It's like, you know, you have the roadmap in your head. Now it's just paving the roads and getting super specialized in what you want to do. Like all the injectables I do now, I never did any of that earlier on. It's so funny, I was showing my, I was looking at my laptop today, cleaning it up, and I have pictures from 17 years ago of uh, the first lip filler patients I did, right? It was like 10 years ago. First lip filler patients I did. And it was amazing because I, I barely knew anything about lip fillers, but I was already a facial plastic surgeon in New York, relatively busy doing facelifts. And, and where I am now versus there, I was like, wow, it's nice to see that. And nice to have all that progress documented because I'm very detail oriented as we document everything, but it's nice to see that. But I, everything I do now, I learned after. So let's go back even further. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Where did you grow up and how did you end up in New York City? Okay, I was, uh, I'm born and raised in Hong Kong. My parents uh, from India. I went to boarding school in Europe and then I came to the States for college. I went to Brown University. I was then luckily as a foreign student, I was luckily accepted to medical school because that was the hard thing. And once I got to medical school, I was luckily accepted to residency. And then because I wasn't a citizen, I couldn't get I did, I did medical school residency here in New York at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. But I wanted to go into private practice. I didn't want to work for the hospital uh, when I graduated, but I couldn't get a license on my own because I wasn't a, a citizen. So I went to an underserved area. I worked in New Mexico for uh, a couple of years. I got my green card, but I got so busy there because I was the only head and neck surgeon. I'm a head and neck surgeon, ENT head and neck surgeon by training, but I was the only head and neck surgeon in my corner of the state we got very busy. I opened another practice, but unfortunately my firstborn had a lot of health complications. So we had to move back to New York uh, at the time I was married. And um, so I closed my practice within 30 days and just came to New York with no license, nothing. And we started again from scratch about 10 years ago. So it's 10 years in the making. <laughs> I'm just struck. It must have been terrifying, not just to go to New Mexico, but really you almost had no choice, right? You had to do something yeah. drastic to be able to stay. But that's right, to stay here. To stay on your track. But right, stay on my track, right, right, right. Yeah. My family's all, we're all entrepreneurs, to be honest. There's no no medical person in my in my family. Mm -hmm. But growing up, my dad had business all over the world. Like yeah, he, he went to Hong Kong when he was 18. You know, the, the whole immigrant story with like $20 in his pocket, he built a huge business. But his business was all over the world. So growing up, we spent time everywhere, whether it was Southeast Asia, South America, Eastern Europe, before it was cool to travel to all those places. He had businesses all over, all over Eastern Europe, especially, and all over Southeast Asia. But so we did a lot of traveling growing up. For me, it was, it was just normal. You went to do what you had to do to get what you have, to achieve what you had to. That was just normal. Mm -hmm. So for me, I didn't think twice about it, but I wouldn't want, I'm hopefully, hopefully building an infrastructure where my kids don't have to do that. That's unless they want to, you know, unless yeah. they want to. And for most people moving around like that and uprooting or starting over is really scary. And it, yeah. you know, it doesn't, you don't have to look very far. Like I just go to my hometown and look at how many people never left. Right. But some of us 
You know, I used to say you just put everything in the car and drive there. And then if it doesn't work, you just drive back. It's not that big of a deal. And it really isn't unless you make it into one. Correct. It, it's really a tremendous story. And uh, it's really wonderful to see how far you've come. We're just getting started. Mm -hmm. Can you <laughs> share any, any of the future plans with us? Just keep going what we're doing. We're looking at other locations for now. We're trying to see what we can do with that. But we want to do that smartly. I suggest Austin, Texas. <laughs> <laughs> we'll look into that for sure. Okay, thanks. Okay. <laughs> Before we wrap it up, if someone's interested in coming to see you, mm -hmm. where should they look for you online? We are everywhere online. Just drmednani.com is my website, but we're on Instagram. It's just Madnani Facial Plastics. On TikTok, Madnani Facial Plastics, YouTube, Facebook, those are... Were you one of the first doctors on Real Self? Were you on it early? From a long time ago, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I remember. It was a great platform. I mean, to be honest, it was, it's been great to have uh, social media come of age while I was, and I jumped on everything early. It was just, I was just like, oh, wow, I can tell people about what I do. And I don't have to like know someone who knows someone or go, you know, work under somebody quote unquote famous mm -hmm. who I don't think results were that great anyway at the time, but they had a name. By a full page in the yellow pages. Right, yellow pages, right? So early on, that, that, it was still, that was still a thing, right? There, I mean, there was a time early in my career where I had to tell people, you don't have to do that anymore. Right, but it's amazing how far we've come. But I think it's, uh, the, everything's saturated, but it's just, I think at least, I think, you know, you put good work out there, you show the results, and yeah. I think it speaks, but you have to tell people that you do good work. The channels change all the time, exactly. and they will keep changing, but the thing that doesn't change is being able or needing to trust the doctor. Right. And the more you can show that in whatever channel you're on, the better off you're going to be. And this platform, mm -hmm. Real Stuff, has helped with that, right? I mean, there, mm -hmm. nothing is perfect, but it's it has helped tremendously. Uh, I mean, there's good and bad with everything, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. And humans behind it all. Exactly. <laughs> For now. For now. For now. No, I don't want to talk about AI. <laughs> For now. Uh. <laughs> I did a chat GPT FAQs on what to ask to find a plastic surgeon. They came up with 20 amazing questions. And I just, my last three posts on my Instagram and YouTube are answering those 20 questions. Mm -hmm. It's actually really good, very insightful. I'll take a look. It's probably better for questions than it is for answers. I right think now. for sure. And that's where, I, that's where we're still for now. Yeah. We're still, we're still one up on that. We will see. Well, thank you so much for spending time with us today. Thank it's you. It's a privilege to get to know you. Thank you. Thank you. Hope you get some rest <laughs> and, an, and an easy flight back. Yes, me too. If you're considering making an appointment or are on your way to meet this doctor, be sure to let them know you heard them on the Meet the Doctor podcast. Check the show notes for links, including the doctor's website and Instagram to learn more. Are you a doctor or do you know a doctor who'd like to be on the Meet the Doctor podcast? Book your free recording session at meetthedoctorpodcast.com. Meet the Doctor is made with love in Austin, Texas and is a production of The Axis, T-H-E-A-X-I-S dot I-O.